Hyanna. I have been doing a lot of thinking lately about signs, the way that I feel life communicates with me. For instance, maybe you've ever thought about your dad and very soon afterwards you've seen a Chinook fly over. Or you've thought to yourself, wow, I'm really hungry, I could use a sandwich. And out of the blue, a friend shows up and they just happen to have an extra sandwich with them. Or maybe you've chosen a random TV show or a movie and you realize that the storyline really hits on some aspects of your life and then you see that the main character's name is Anna. Little things like that that are, uh oh, but, hmm, is that a sign? I think they are. I think that things like that that happen are ways that life, like I said, that life communicates with me, that life guides me. So very recently, I went on vacation and I always take a book with me. But I try not to take anything too cerebral. I wasn't in the mood for a romance. So I did have a stack of those scholastic um, young adult books. I gather them up from time to time when I go to Goodwill if they're in really good condition and keep them on hand just for some light reading. So I grabbed one. Didn't really pay attention. I just grabbed one. Threw it in my carry-on. So I was on a four-hour flight and decided that I would go ahead and get started reading the book. So the book I had chosen was called The Secret Hum of a Daisy, and it's by Tracy Holzer. And as I usually do when I start a book, I have to read the back, I have to read the inside covers, I have to read the prologue before I actually get started reading. So I read the back of the book first, and it says, Grace and her mom have always had each other, traveling around just the two of them. But Grace wants more. She dreams of a place to call home. Just when she thinks they've found it, though, tragedy strikes. Grace is sent to live with her grandmother, who she's never met, in a town she's never visited. As she begins to learn more about her mother's family in her hometown, Grace starts noticing signs of her mother almost everywhere she looks. And so she sets off on a treasure hunt, sure that her mother is sending clues to show her the way home. But where can home be for someone who has never really had one? So I have chosen a book about a mother and daughter, and I'm assuming that the daughter loses the mother. So with that in mind, I begin reading the book. Now, the main character's name is Grace. She is a 12-year-old girl, and she does, in fact, lose her mother um, in a tragic accident. So just two pages into this book, I'm thinking, I'm not sure this is the lighthearted book I was looking for because it's already hit on two aspects of my life. But I decide, okay, we're going to at least make it through chapter one and see where this is going. So make it through chapter one and into chapter two, the first sentence of chapter two. Mama said she started living the day I was born. Okay. <laughs> that, that made me smile. Because, and I'm sure this is the way it is for a lot of mothers when they have their babies. Your life changes for sure. For me, I almost felt like something got switched on. When you were born, this intense, powerful desire to live. But it wasn't just to live, it was more like living with greater purpose. And so, in that respect, my life did begin the day that you were born. As I continue reading, I learned that. Grace has to go live with her grandmother after her mom's funeral and find out that Grace's mom and her grandmother had not had a relationship for quite some time. And part of this was due to the fact that the grandmother had sent Grace's mother away when she was 17. But 
a lot of the reason that they didn't have a relationship was because there was a huge lack of communication. But I also realized that there is a lack of communication between Grace and her mother. And in chapter three, we find this to be very true because Grace knows practically nothing about her grandmother. The only thing that she knows is what her mother had told her, which is that her grandmother had sent her mother away when she was 17. So through the years, Grace had developed this story in her mind because her mother wouldn't tell her any more about her grandmother or her family. Grace had all these questions that were unanswered, so Grace developed these false tales to make up the answers for her questions. And in doing so, had created her grandmother into this evil, mean person. And so when Grace had to go live with her grandmother, she couldn't get past the fact that she thought her grandmother was evil and mean. So Grace treats her grandmother very badly. And at one point contacts a woman named Mrs. Green, who had been a friend to Grace and her mother. And Grace tells her, Mrs. Green, that she doesn't want to live with her grandmother. She wants to come live with her. So Mrs. Green tells Grace, she's your grandma, Grace. You have to give it time. Everyone deserves a bit of time. Grace says, what about what I deserve? Mrs. Green says, you deserve to be loved, but sometimes you can't see what that looks like for yourself. You've got too much mad mixed up in there. Too much sorrow. So you and I both know that in tragedy, in times of our life where things, where bad things have happened, it's, it's natural to be sad. It's natural to be angry, to be fearful. But some people tend to live in that space. It becomes a very negative space to live in, and they carry that anger and that emptiness and that loneliness around with them for a very long time. And this is what Grace has done. She's, she's carried around this big empty space because she hasn't had answers to her questions. Now, in chapter three, we also find out that there's going to be horses involved. And you know how I love horses. Now, the next couple of chapters deal with Grace learning about her grandmother. And she's finding that the stories that she has in her head of her grandmother aren't quite fitting what she's seeing in her grandmother's actions. Now, she's still fighting to go live with Mrs. Green. And she has a conversation with her grandmother. Grace says to her grandmother, It's not like you want me here. And her grandmother responds, If I didn't want you here, you wouldn't be here. Grace says, You're my only next of kin, so you don't have a choice. Her grandmother responds, Everyone has a choice. I was so mixed up. The person I'd made up grandma to be someone hard and cruel, just didn't match this woman who stood across from me. It is so difficult to put your trust in somebody that you've had such a negative image of for so long. Even if you had a good image of them, a good relationship with them in the past, that negative image can sometimes trump anything that makes sense. But actions do speak louder than words. Now, in these chapters, we also learn more about Grace's mother and her connection to cranes. She builds metal sculptures into cranes, and in every crane that she builds, she leaves a message in it, a way of releasing her fears, a way of releasing her sorrow, is 
how Grace's mother deals with her life. She puts all of that into her artwork. And Grace, likewise, uses writing, poetry, as her outlet for putting out her feelings and trying to understand her feelings. Now, Grace has been finding little paper origami cranes throughout the neighborhood, and she has come to feel that this is her mother trying to guide her to find the answers to her questions. These are, these are signs for Grace. And every time that Grace finds a crane, she questions why. Why is she finding this crane? What is it trying to lead her to? And likewise, any time that I find something, discover something in life that feels like a sign to me, I always ask why. Why is this resonating with me? And quite often the answer that I come up with is just that this is a way that life is telling me that everything is okay, that everything will be okay, and that I just have to keep trusting. Now, as I continue to read, um, Grace develops a relationship with one of the horses from next door. And as she's petting this horse for the first time, this is what Grace reflects. I'd never fed a horse before and realized with a shudder that my whole arm could fit in her mouth, but I was committed. So I figured I'd just do it the way I'd seen it done on some animal show on TV. I put out my hand flat and she brought her muzzle down, her lips like velvet across my skin as they gathered up the apple. She had big teeth. After she finished, she nudged my hand for more. Sorry, girl. Besides, it looks like you've been eating plenty. I patted her round belly through the wire fence, and then her belly kicked my hand. I pulled back, startled. Once I realized what I'd felt, I pressed both hands against her belly, where I felt more movement. A baby. I stood there and stroked her nose until her eyes were droopy, imagining being connected to Mama that way. There was a sudden rush of sadness that got so big, I was sure it would munch me up in three small bites. There is definitely a connection between a mother and her child. It is, and I've said it before, it is a connection that cannot be broken. Regardless of how bad things get between a mother and her child, there is always heartstrings between the two. So no matter how many miles are between us, or how many days and months and years go by that we haven't spoken, the connection that you and I have will always be there. It is, it is infinite. It is permanent. The next chapters, we start to learn more about Grace's father. And he died in another tragic accident before Grace was even born. Now, in learning more about her father, Grace is also learning more about her grandmother and her mother. And slowly the pieces are coming together, and Grace is actually learning about herself. She's taking the very little bit of information that her mother gave her and allowing the other information that her mother's friends, her grandmother's friends, the people who are in her mother's hometown, the, the information that she gathers from them, she's piecing everything together and realizing the truth. She is discovering the truth about who she is and where she came from. I don't feel that a person can truly know themselves if they don't know where they come from, if they don't know their family, if they don't know their history. And that brings me to chapter 15. This was probably the most important chapter in realizing that this book is a book that I was supposed to read, that this book was a sign. 
because if the fact that this book was about a mother and daughter, the fact that Grace was a 12-year-old girl who lost her mom, the fact that this book is about signs, has horses involved in it, if all of that didn't make me feel that this was a book I was supposed to read, the name of Grace's mother did. And the name of Grace's mother is Anna. <laughs> the other thing that happened in this chapter is that it mentioned the class of 1985, and that's the year I graduated high school. Mm. In the last chapters of the book, Grace is starting to question, really question her reality. She had had these stories about her grandmother floating around in her mind for so long that she was afraid to change her thinking. She had been hurt before, what was to stop her new reality from hurting just the same? So in another conversation with Mrs. Green, Mrs. Green came over and put her arms around me. Grace says, I always figured everything was grandma's fault. Mama moving over and over, trying to find a place to fit, but it doesn't feel true anymore. Mrs. Green asks, what feels true? Grace says, I don't know, but I do know that Grandma didn't want me. Mrs. Green says, what your Grandma didn't want was the situation. There's a big difference. And in another conversation that Grace has with her grandmother's friend Miranda, Miranda says, sometimes we lose pieces of who we are in times of great sorrow and distress, and then we have to find a way to get them back. Your Grandma lost so much of herself when your Grandpa died, and then when your Mama got off that bus... Grace thinks, the truth of that finally hit me. How much grandma had lost, her husband and then her daughter, her granddaughter. I thought about her sitting in her living room by the fire day after day, waiting for her daughter to come home, waiting for a phone call or a letter that never came for years. I think that's why your mama left too. She lost herself. Some people think space is the answer, but somehow in the wide open they might stumble into answers. Soon enough, it's just easier to stay gone. It should have made me angry, her saying that, but it didn't, because it was true. And eventually Grace realizes that sometimes people are doing the best they can, even in bad situations. Grandma shrugged. I didn't know what else to do. Grace says, you're the grandma you should have known. Even as I said it, I realized that sometimes people did what they could, not what they should, and I didn't think that was reason enough to be mad. At the end of the book, Grace finally accepts the fact that in order to move on with life, she has to face her fear. She has to let go of those negative stories that she had told herself about her grandmother and she had to step into a new chapter that was based on truth. So in this next reading, Grace is reflecting on something that another one of her grandmother's friends had said to her. Marjorie had talked about a cavernous space and how it can grow between people. It was so easy to stay on your side of that space instead of wading through all that emptiness and loneliness, making a thousand wrong turns. But Grandma had headed out into it anyway. By answering my letters, even the angry ones, and telling me the truth about things, Grandma walked out to meet me halfway, and maybe that was enough. But I had to do my part. And even though I was scared of a million different things, of losing everything again, I did it. So I hope that you can see why I feel like this book was put in my path for me to read, um, why I feel like it was a sign from life that everything's going to be okay. It touched on so many aspects of my life with and without you. 
just the, the closeness of Grace and her mother reminded me of the closeness between you and me. And just like Grace and her grandmother had to face their fears and face their truth in order to move forward into a healthy relationship, I take little signs like this and it gives me hope that you and I will face our fears together, that we will face our truth, and that we will be able to walk into a positive and healthy relationship again as well. I hope that maybe you'll take the time to read this book. It, um, is a much more detailed book than I had gone through. And I also hope that someday you will choose to meet me halfway. I love you, sweetheart. Bye-bye.